our person of interest is the health cabinet secretary James Masharia. He's joining us. A lot of health issues uh, have been making headlines in the past uh, few weeks, and so uh, rightfully so that he come through at this particular time to help us have a clear understanding and just a conversation around these uh, important issues in the country. So thank you, sir, for thank making you. time for thank us you. this My morning. Pleasure. My pleasure. Sana. My pleasure. Um, let's begin with Mombasa County. I mm. think for everybody that's very important right now. Um, several deaths have been reported there and patients continue to suffer going to hospital, being turned away uh, and the workers, the health workers and doctors mm. saying they're going to continue to stay away from work. And last week what we had were reassurances that money had been sent out because this is all about pay. What's going on? Mm. Thank you. Yeah, uh, like, like I said last week uh, on Wednesday, uh, by end of Tuesday, yes. we had uh, only three counties which are not paid their salaries. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, Mombasa, Busia, and Machakos County. On Wednesday, uh, Machakos and Busia did pay. So the only county remaining was actually Mombasa. We did communicate with the management of the, of the county government, mm -hmm. and they confirmed that by Friday, the money will be paid. Uh, Look at what was said yesterday, uh, money was wired through the GP and the IFMI system by the county government. And so I like to believe that uh, even Mombasa has paid. Mm -hmm. Now, if there are other issues to do with maybe administration, management of the institution and the county government, that is something which we shall be addressing together with the county government. As you know, the health function is devolved. Mm -hmm. And so we can do as so much as a, as a national government in terms of addressing those issues. Uh, I was surprised to see on TV actually some of the union leaders who are not even employees of government. They're in the forefront trying to agitate and uh, trying to, uh, if you like, motivate the workers to go on strike. I think that's true and called for because they know that the health sector is a very sensitive sector. And we would like to believe that uh, the health workers will today go back to work. Yeah. yeah, because they have not yet received the money. So who do they go to for that? Because we're hearing them, the, the ping pong has been between the national government. You maintain the money has already been disbursed. The county government has, it has not trickled down yeah. to the workers. So what happens if they don't get that money today? You see, let me clarify. The money never comes to us. Okay. Never. The entire budget for the counties is actually if you like, uh, remitted up front. You heard about the 226 billion, which yes. the national government, through Treasury, was uh, actually allocating to the counties. That money is sent. And so my ministry has got nothing to do. I don't see a penny for that money. Mm -hmm. And so when they don't pay, it puts me in a dilemma as health minister. <laughs> because on the one hand, I know I'm responsible because the health docket yeah, is... because uh, many would assume that stops with yes. you which indeed is a big problem because the money is not with me. Okay. So I would like to urge the management of the county, uh, the governor himself, to make sure that uh, actually he does make sure that the workers go to work. Yeah. Yes. Because one of the issues, and I remember perhaps we'll be getting him online to just uh, uh, contribute in this conversation, is when this devolution came into place um, in terms of health care, yeah. there were many concerns with stakeholders saying the counties are not ready to take on these mm. functions. Do you regret that these functions were perhaps <laughs> devolved a little bit too first, that perhaps more time should have been taken because of what we are seeing now playing out? You see, uh, whether devolution is working or whether the health function should be devolved, the opinion depends on who you're talking to. If you talk to the governors, they say they were ready from day one. And that's why the national government did not, did not actually get involved in any protracted arguments. Mm -hmm. The gov government devolved the function way back in uh, July last year uh, because the governors said they were ready uh, to do so. And so if they're having issues, they are basically now creating that impression that they were not ready. And I would like to urge that the few counties which are having issues to do with human resources, they deal with those issues, you know, very quickly. Because otherwise, it will give the impression that indeed the people who are against that uh, development of uh, the health function, mm -hmm. it will give the impression that they were right. And so I would like to request that the Council of Governors, mm -hmm. uh, read by Governor Isaac Ruto, they sit, they iron out all the HR issues to make sure that they don't keep on coming back to national government. So for you, the devolution in itself should not have perhaps been staggered so that they, they slowly take on the functions. Because it's, it's health sector is important, it's huge. So for you, it happened as it should, and everything that is is just an impression that's been created and not really the uh, challenges that you perhaps foresee being on the ground? 
You see, uh, one thing which had to be done instantly was the human resources. Yeah. Because that's something you cannot do piecemeal. Uh, because you can imagine if you did piecemeal in terms of human resource functions, mm -hmm. there would be a lot of disparities between uh, the way the counties are managed. And so it was important uh, after the TRA uh, did the assessment and consulted the governors and confirmed that the, the counties were ready. You could not actually do it piecemeal because a function is a function. You had to like, put the HR at a go or just wait okay. for the counties to develop uh, the capacity. In this case, the counties came and said they have the capacity. The TRA confirmed their capacity. And so it was devolved. We had to do our constitutional duty ourselves as, go as government, national government. And Were did you convinced they had the capacity? Well, as you see, the, that function of determining capacity not on you. was with the transitional authority. Okay. They did go county by county and confirmed that they had capacity because it's them who had to sign off right. the, the transfer of the functions. Let's talk to the Secretary General KMPDU. He's on the line for us this morning because he's one of those who felt uh, that uh, that function should not have been devolved healthcare so fast, at least there should have been some staggering in terms of capacity of the counties. And good morning, Secretary General uh, Sultani Matandachero. Thank you for joining us. So what we're hearing is that the, in terms of pay, the workers in Mombasa should be getting their money. It's already been released, and it really does not lie with the Ministry of Health. What do you have to say about what you're hearing this morning? OK, um, for me, I just want to say that uh, uh, I just want to confirm that uh, the health workers have not yet received their salary. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is the position, you know, because uh, promises have been made, especially in the last few weeks. Uh, we have had situations where we are told that uh, the monies have been released, you'll have them in the course of tomorrow and so on. Then two weeks down the line, you find that the money is not yet there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, on the discussion that is ongoing, I don't want to be the one to say whether national government or county government is right. Uh, but uh, I just want to point out that these are the things we talked about. The fact is that uh, our members are really suffering. Today is the 26th. It is uh, really worrying that uh, a good number of our members have not received their salary. So it is something that uh, we know where the problem is, and I think we have to be objective enough so that uh, we don't go talking about theoretical issues and solutions. So, so for you, uh, where is the just problem? Look at the problem. Yeah. Where, where is the problem? We talked about it last year. We said that uh, we have looked at the way in which attempts are being made at devolving health, uh, health services, mm -hmm. and uh, it is not practical to devolve them that way. But uh, unfortunately, this issue was politicized, and, the, and the, 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 the administration went away, went ahead, and devolved health care in the way they did. So now you can see the things we talked about: delayed salaries have already started happening. So before and we, we are, let you go, let me yeah. cut you short, sorry. So how would you have it done? Because I think that's what we were trying to understand. Uh, you said the manner in which it was done, the other politicization. How, as KMPDU, would you have it done? No, we advised that uh, this uh, devolution should be done in accordance with the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So that uh, some of the functions are retained at national level and uh, the ones that had been uh, allocated to the counties are taken to the counties. And then those which were taken to the counties be done in phases as, uh, as per the provisions of the law, the, devolve, uh, the Transition to Devolved Government Act. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for talking to us, uh, Secretary General KMP, do you, uh, Sultani Matindachero, uh, for us there. What do you have to say about what he said? Well, uh, as I said, uh, I think uh, Sultan has got uh, some valid observations. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, once again, I would like to repeat that whereas it's not all the counties which are having issues, we have just maybe one or two or three counties mm -hmm. which are giving this impression that the, the entire country is not functioning. Right now, you agree with me, it's just one county, which is Mombasa. Yeah. And uh, you, clearly you cannot use one county which is out of 47 to say that the entire system, system is not, not working. However, I must say this very clearly, that the county governments clearly must do more. They must do more mm -hmm. to give uh, Kenyans assurance that indeed they are ready for this function. Because when you have these kind of issues arising, uh, it uh, does not augur very well with uh, the confidence Kenyans have 
with the county governments. Okay. So I like to urge them to put a lot more emphasis. I know there's a lot of politics going around on other issues which I don't want to discuss. But I think people should focus a lot more on sorting out administrative uh, and management issues because before some, we go into politics. Some had suggested that perhaps the, the human resource should have been left to the national government and not handled by the county governments. Would that have been feasible? You see, uh, the premise of bringing the, the human resource function to the counties was one, that you are dealing with a health sector with a function which deals with people services mm -hmm. and therefore you cannot really manage a service or enhance the level of service if you're not dealing with the service delivery uh, you know the, the resource people, yeah. the people themselves mm. because uh, there was this talk about how do we supervise the workers for example if the the function is with the national government and so there was a valid uh, reason to say let the human resource function go to the counties so that in terms of supervision in terms of management it can be a lot more you know, efficient. Uh, but what is coming out clearly, there are some uh, areas whereby a lot of improvement is required. Is required. So yes. what this morning you're telling the health workers and the doctors, and essentially the residents, especially those who need medical treatment uh, at the coast region, is that as the health CSU hands are tied in as far as their pay is concerned and them going back to work for treatment of those who need it, your hands are tied, it's up to the county government in Mombasa. Well, it's tied, but we are still talking to them. Uh, last week I did talk to the county management, I spoke to the county executive for health in Mombasa, although she doesn't report to me, mm -hmm. she reports to the governor, and to say, can you please make sure these, these issues are sorted out. Okay. So we are talking to them, but you see, end of the day, we cannot force them to write the check. It's for them to know that that's their duty to do so, <laughs> in terms of paying the workers. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, is the responsibility we they have to take maybe a bit more seriously? just to make sure that we don't have these issues anymore. All right. Yes. Let's move away from that to the Ebola question. DRC recording some cases, and Kenya uh, has a lot of dealings in terms of business movement from there to Kenya. Um, and you have uh, recently said that in terms of measures at the entry points and border points in Kenya, um, screening has been upgraded. When you say upgraded, mm -hmm. what exactly is happening? What is the screening we are seeing at the border points? Uh, yes, as you know, uh, we were the first country actually to ban passengers coming to this country mm -hmm. from those three countries. And we took a risk because we thought uh, it was extremely important to protect the health of the 42 million Kenyans. It was a difficult decision because, as you know, uh, thereafter, there have been some diplomatic, if you like, uh, grumble, grumbling yes, from some those countries. Threats, sort some of. threats. Yeah. But you see, what is critically important is to make sure that the, the health of the 42 million Kenyans was safeguarded. So we did that. And as we did not ban airlines, we banned actually the, the passengers coming to this country. So when people say we banned KQ, we didn't. We actually didn't ban Ethiopian. Or we say that no airline can bring or nobody can bring passengers from those three countries. Well, in essence, it's interfering yes. with their functions because if they yes. cannot come, then they can't, Kenya can, can, yes. will not fly there because then they cannot <laughs> bring those passengers here. Yeah, which was deliberate because we knew people could come by road. Okay. You could fly to another country and then even walk into the, into the country. True, true. And so we made sure that uh, that decision was all inclusive. However, now with the development of DRC, we knew we were going to face more challenges because it meant that there are more border points uh, who, which will be exposed. For example, uh, we have uh, Malaba mm -hmm. and Busia. And uh, because most of the trucks go through Busia, what you had to do was to make sure that the capacity at Busia border point was, uh, was very much materially enhanced. So we sent more doctors, we sent more health, health personnel, we sent more kits to basically Busia to make sure that the truck drivers leaving and coming into this country are screened mm -hmm. and make sure it's done properly. Because uh, as you know, Ebola started in the Congo. And yep. so we do not know uh, whether this Ebola in West Africa is actually linked with what we have in, in the Congo right now. The WHO is doing its tests, and I think those, those, those tests will, be, will confirm whether this is the Ebola of 1976 or this is the Ebola of... What we're seeing of this year. Yes. So are we going to see that ban extend to DRC, people from DRC as well? I think it all depends on the outcome of these uh, WHO tests. Uh, they may confirm that indeed this is a localized uh, Ebola. As you know, Ebola started. But Ebola will be Ebola, whether it's localized or it's the one in these other countries. The threat still is high for Kenya. But you see, that Ebola in uh, in DRC has always been there since 1976, okay. along Ebola liver. So 
it may be that it's very much uh, even localized, localized and therefore okay. there will be no need to escalate it to the international borders mm. in terms of crossing uh, the borders with the DRC. All right. Yeah. Um, in terms of the screening, again, back to that, because we know Ebola has the uh, almost three weeks incubation period. What exactly, what tests are you carrying out? Because it could be just simply, are you coughing? Are you having this? What exactly mm. are you taking people through? Okay, what happens, the first thing is uh, from the point, before we ban the flights, mm. Before you exited those countries, you'd be, you'd be screened. If you had, say, high temperature and so forth, then you'd be isolated. Then in flight, if you got sick in flight, the, the crew of Kenya Airways, for example, would know what to do. Then upon arrival at JKA, we had uh, actually two gates dedicated to passengers from those three countries. One was for passengers in transit. Mm -hmm. The other one was passengers coming to this country. And what you do first of all is check the fever because um, one of the manifestations of Ebola is high fever. So if you had a temperature above 37.2 centigrade, then you'd be subjected to other tests. Mm -hmm. And then of course there'd be other tests to check whether you've know, got headache, whether you've got joint pains, you know, whether you've got a sore throat, all those issues would be checked. And if we confirm that all those symptoms are there, then you'll be put in isolation ward, which has been, sorry, a uh, room at JKIA for even further tests. Mm -hmm. So they will take their blood and then further tests will be done. And then eventually, uh, if indeed there's a real suspicious case, like we had a few, you'll be taken to Kenyatta National Hospital where there is an isolation ward. And then we shall take the blood samples to Camry, which uh, will be done for about six hours mm -hmm. and then confirm whether or not you got uh, the disease or not. Okay. Because what? yes, it's true, one of the yes. biggest risk is that incubation, yeah, period. The incubation period. Because yeah. you can come in the country with no symptoms, then you, you disappear in the countryside, mm -hmm. and then you develop the disease thereafter. So, th so we had to make sure also surveillance thereafter was very, very diligent. So they're leaving their details as details to where they're telephone going, numbers, where they're going, and so forth. Okay. That's why we worked closely with immigration, because we formed a team which you call the crisis management team. We've got 13 members. Among them is the police, immigration, and airport staff mm. to make sure we can monitor this, the passengers as they come into the country. What about the Kenyans who are stuck in the countries where you've banned people from coming into Kenya? What happened to those Kenyans who are outside and want to come back? As I said, that was a difficult decision which we had to make. Um, when we made that decision, we actually did in consultation with Kenya Airways. They did tell us that they had about uh, two weeks of fully booked flights, you know, leaving Mon Monrovia, you know, leaving Freetown. But see, we could not wait for two weeks. So it's a difficult decision. Certainly they'll find their way out. How? <laughs> you have said you've they got to the, come back home. <laughs> they find their way out through the borders and uh, other, other means. But, um, but for them, they are allowed to come into the country. It's just they have to find a way out of uh, those three countries. When you say find a way, bre mm. break that down. What do you mean find a way? Well, you see, people are still living through uh, borders from the Sierra Leone and from Liberia. So they need to get creative. Yeah, they have to get either through... Because some flights are still flying maybe to other West African countries. Okay. So they fly to those countries or even to Europe mm -hmm. and then fly themselves here. What we could not wait is two weeks. Two weeks for yes, them. Yes, it's going to be too long. Okay. Yeah. With this n recent outbreak of Ebola and, you know, the threats to Kenya and the measures that have been put in place to ensure we do not uh, have a case coming to the country or if, if the event it happens and the country is prepared, it has also just brought about some weaknesses. It has exposed some of those weaknesses in terms of just the basic infrastructure and skills and know-how. Why do we have to wait for these things to again start, you know, putting house together? I think we are one of the most, most prepared country. Okay. Do you know we had actually, we have Ebola experts in this country mm -hmm. who we trained long before this outbreak. We have doctors who we sent to actually those countries like uh, Congo, you know, we send them to Europe for training specifically for Ebola. That's why when we had this outbreak, uh, some three weeks ago, we sent actually two doctors, special, specialist doctors to Liberia and to, to Sierra Leone to basically do the actual further you know, monitoring and assessment of the mm -hmm. situation on the ground. So we do have experts. Uh, what of course maybe we didn't have was the, this physical infrastructure, like putting up you know, fa prefabricated uh, units at Kenyatta National Hospital, which was done within a week. Um, because whereas we asked for a budget mm -hmm. to be allocated, right. you know the ministry always has got emergency funds, right. which we actually utilized for that purpose. Mm. Yes. All right. Let's talk about maternal health. Uh, away from Ebola, we'll continue to watch events mm. as they unfold on that front. Mm. Um, it's a flagship 
project for the Jubilee government. A lot of money, um, infrastructure has gone into that. But uh, just recently, one of the things that uh, the governor, Kidero, said about uh, Pumwani Hospital, that it has only one working theater and a single ambulance that constantly breaks down and hardly meets the hospital demands. So while we are seeing a lot of investment going into that, it seems only to deal with, to, to, to handle and deal with one facet of maternal health, and that's deliveries. What about the other issues around maternal health? Because it's not just one-sided, it's multiple issues. Yeah, let me say that uh, this um, initiative, the free maternity service, mm -hmm. was the first in the Jubilee government. And that's a fact, because you know it was launched on the 1st of June 2013 only two weeks after we got into government. And we took the commitment, we knew it was expensive, we knew the repercussions about numbers going up and the challenges coming in. Yeah. But we had to make that decision. Because see, until then, you know, uh, the number of mothers dying because of, of pregnancy-related diseases or complications was actually very alarming. You know, uh, and, and for one reason, because very few mothers were going, or women were going to, to hospitals hospital. for delivery, 44% which was way below other African countries. So we had to take that decision very quickly within two weeks. It was launched. We put a budget of 3.4 billion shillings. Uh, and uh, within six months, the results were remarkable. We had a spike from 44% to 66% within six months. Mm -hmm. We have saved lives. Uh, maternal mortality rates has gone down by about 8%. You know, the child mortality rate, children dying, because children mortality is related to mother mortality went down by about 15.3%, uh, saving about 16,000 children. Uh, the transmission of mother to child yeah, because of HIV, this HIV was actually reduced from 14% to about, to about 8%. Mm -hmm. So we had to do it. And it was so successful that we want to actually strengthen the, the initiative in the coming financial year by putting aside 4.1 billion shillings. Yes, it was important not just look at delivery because you see, um, Having a baby is not just having a having baby. A baby. Yeah. You, you start from the time of conception. And that's why we had to make sure that women were encouraged to go to hospitals so that, for example, if we have high blood pressure, we detect that condition from day one. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't do so, and you are in the village, you don't know you have blood pressure because there's no pain, what you happen is uh, eventually you're going to lose your baby because after maybe six months, the blood pressure will go up, you lose your baby, and also you have the risk yourself of losing uh, your life. So we have to make sure that we introduce the free maternity service so people can go to hospitals or prenatal and thereafter, you know, postnatal, you know, uh, services. Secondly, to make sure this maternity service was strengthened, the president did also waive the fees for going to hospitals. So you see, for the countryside or for the poor people, you find even 20 shillings was a big problem. So it was waived. And you'll be shocked by the response. We had, previously we used to have like 12 million Kenyans going to these dispensaries and health centers. Mm -hmm. Within the first one year, that number has gone to 18 million Kenyans, which means there was 6 million Kenyans who could not afford that 2020 bob. So that program has gone to support the free maternity. Because as I said, I'm aware that uh, the free maternity is not just having a baby. Yes. It's, 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 it's a complete package. Because even the numbers you've given, those were the quick successes you were able to realize six mm. months on launching this, the free uh, services. But the system seems to be unraveling now with the realities on the ground where you read stories of one nurse having to uh, assist four different women give birth and there's just one bed for them as well. So these are the realities whilst it was a welcome move initially, then the dreaded challenges, yeah. you know, are, you know, so what is going to be done well, about that? Yeah, I agree we took this with challenges. And challenges will be there maybe until we deal with all these issues. For example, when you, when you took this decision, we had a shortfall of nurses, 42,000. Uh, doctors, maybe another 20,000, even as we are talking. But you see, the issue is, for the next four years, we have put a program to hire more nurses. We put a budget to make sure that every year we hire 12,000 additional health workers. Mm -hmm. Among those, 9,000 will be, will be nurses. Majority of them will be midwives, right, to make sure that that gap is closed. 
So I believe that uh, it's not something which we could not we could have achieved on day one. But what, what is important is to make sure we have a program over the next four years. Make sure the county governments also allocate enough money. Because as I said earlier, this function is devolved. When they get the 226 billion or whatever amount, they have to make sure that health is given priority. Mm. Um, I've seen some counties actually doing very well. Like my Chacos, for example, despite the issue about salaries mm -hmm. <laughs> early alone. They have cleaned up the place, they are putting more workers on the ground. And that's what they need to do, uh, because other than spend so much money on other areas, health is very critical, because it creates a very vibrant, if you like, uh, development base. Okay, yeah. because when you mentioned Machakos, I remember the ambulances that were bought, and some of the questions in that was in terms of how they come into use with the emergency cases vis-a-vis -vis other, uh, perhaps, uh, systems that would have been put in place that perhaps priorities there were a bit missed. Would you agree with that assessment? Uh, not really. You see, if you're starting from zero, whatever you get is important. Okay. Somebody may say that the 70 uh, ambulances Governor Mutua got were not fully equipped ambulances. But if you're starting from zero, you really have no choice. I was very impressed when we went there with the first lady uh, some two months ago. Things, things are working. At least that, that vehicle you saw has got the basic facilities. Because in some areas, they have nothing. And uh, patients were being put in pantatus <laughs> to go to hospitals. At least in Machakos, with the 70 you know, ambulances, that makes a big difference. Okay. Mm. So let's go back to those challenges. You talked about hiring of, of more staff coming on board. What about the facilities themselves? You look at the referral hospital, Kenyatta National Hospital. It's strained. The situation there, some would argue despicable, you know, suicides left, right, and center that we've been witnessing in recent past. The numbers of people, just as I mentioned earlier, sharing a bed. What's, what needs to change? Because something must give for this to change. Yeah, what needs to change is what exactly we are trying to do now. Yeah. Um, you saw in the current financial year, which is 2014, 2015, we have put a budget to put equipment worth 34 billion shillings. That has already floated. We are closing it on the 8th of September. Right. And the idea is to do an uh, innovative way of financing the health, the health system. Today, because of historic neglect, which I must say was there, if you, are able to, if you want to equip all the hospitals which we have, the 293 hospitals, it will cost you um, possibly uh, one trillion shillings because of the his because the medical equipment is very expensive. Right. So what you've done is to start this year yes. by putting a budget of 34 billion to do what we call the managed service contracts, whereby we, we shall get the big companies to come in and place equipment. We shall pay over time, over 10 years, but at least we shall, we shall have diagnostic equipment, Renault, which we don't have, which is kidney, you know, cardiovascular, there's a lot of heart problems. Mm -hmm. You know, we have issues with uh, cancer and issues with ICU and trauma because of the accidents we are having in this country. So we, we are prepared. I think after the 8th of September, we hope we shall get re good responses from bidders. We shall quickly go to evaluation. We shall place that equipment in our hospitals. It will be a very good beginning. Yeah. We do 94 hospitals in the next financial year. The next financial year, we hope we have to do an, equ an equal number of uh, hospitals. The final year, before you go to elections, we do another one or five hospitals. You have covered the entire health system. And I believe that will make a big difference. So you're seeing having put up how many hospitals in total? In total, we have 293 hospitals in this country. Okay. So we shall do 94, 94, 105. To make and sure that's the reassurance coming? That's what I would like to do. Okay. With, with the support of parliament and the governors. So this is going to be the national government, you as the health ministry, putting this up. What about the role of the county governments in also improving the facilities at that level? You see, we have to do this national program mm -hmm. for one reason, that uh, not all counties will run at the same pace. Today, if, for example, I, I give money to Nairobi, mm -hmm. then I give the same money to another county, or rather, we, we, we allocate cash as opposed to equipment. Some counties will do well, others will not do well. Yet we require the same standard of service across the country. Whether you're in Trukana or Nairobi or Kiabu or Wajia, we like the same level of service. Right. Hence, we decided to have it as a national program so that we do not have counties doing different things. We could have done this as a way of saying, this 34 billion equipment, divide by 47 and give, give all those counties. But you've seen the issues arising from the counties. Some are doing well, some are not doing badly. Some are, some are doing so well are doing so badly. Yes. So we like to equalize the level of standard across the country. Mm. 
And so, whereas I've seen some, uh, some governors saying that, I think it was Governor Isaac Ruto saying they, were like, they don't want the equipment, they want the cash, that we shall not agree, we shall not agree to. Okay. If they insist on the cash, we shall cancel the program. Yes, yeah, because we know <laughs> yes. how that might go. Yes, yes. Uh, but you mentioned about hiring of 12,000 nurses. Is that your role or the counties to do the hiring? That is the counties, but facilitated by the national government. So how mm -hmm. does that work? They get the money, but we, 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 we help them in terms of, say, setting the standards as to who should be employed. Okay. So we work closely between us and them. But the cash has already been taken to the counties. A little bit more on maternal health and devolution and how we're going to see that play out. You're supposed to have a meet tomorrow with, with the governors. What is it you're seeking to achieve with this? Yes, uh, tomorrow we have a major meeting which has been convened with the support of the UNFPA uh, and we have to thank them very much for that. Mm -hmm. uh, also the support of the World Bank. We realize that these programs of maternal, newborn and child health, as a national government we cannot go very far without the input, the concurrence, and support of the governors. So we say, let them bring them on board. Yes. And what we've done is to bring all the 47 counties, governors, also with their, with, you know, with their spouses, because those, the spouses also play a big role. The first lady is also supporting us, she'll be there as well. Uh, and the idea is to make sure these programs we are talking about are rolled out and cascaded with the governor's concurrence. On top of that, we, make sure we have segregated uh, or isolated about 15 counties, which are the most affected. Mm -hmm. uh, and those ones, they have confirmed they'll be there. Because without those 15 counties, we shall never be able to succeed in bringing down maternal mortality. Give us some of them. Most of them are north and northeastern. Okay. For example, Wajia, Trukana, Madela, right? Uh, then we have uh, some in western Kenya and Nyanza because of HIV prevalence. And interestingly, even Nairobi and Kakamega wow. is one of the, the included as well. So we need to bring, if we have to bring down these matern maternal mortality rates, we have to deal with those 15 counties. Counties. Yes. You've mentioned HIV, and let's talk about that a, a bit, because according to Beyond Zero Aid, is the leading cause of death and disability in Kenya. Kenya has the fourth highest in terms of population uh, of those affected. So, but many successes, of course, in the past the recent years have been registered in the fight against this virus. But many are still vulnerable. When we talk about young women aged between 15 and about uh, 30 years, the infection rate there is four times more than men of that age. What is it the government is planning to combat that? And also, uh, in our prisons, men to men, mm -hmm. you know, transmission as well. What is it? Yeah. That's in the works. Yeah, what we've done is to first of all isolate the most vulnerable populations mm -hmm. with regard to HIV. And you'll be shocked to hear that uh, of, all, of the 1.6 billion Kenyans who live with HIV, 100,000 relate to those groups, like the sex workers, the men having sex with men, and drug pushers. 100,000. Right. But they contribute one third of all the HIV cases. So to deal with the HIV issue, we have to deal with those vulnerable groups. Mm -hmm. And that's why, if you remember, there was a case one time where people were trying to criminalize this uh, issue about homosexuality and whatever. Yes. And it had a very adverse effect because those people went underground. They stopped going to the clinics. They stopped mm -hmm. going for counseling. And so it was going to have a very, very bad effect in terms of the HIV transmission. So we came out as a ministry very strongly to say that debate was uncalled for. Number one. Number two, we have also realized that uh, women who got HIV, they are transmitting uh, cases to their children. The children yes. Every year we have 13,000 children who get affected through their mothers. Mm -hmm. Every year. So of all the 100,000 new cases every year, 13,000 are children who are innocent <laughs> coming from their, from their mothers. Sad, yeah. So what you've done as, as a government is to introduce what we call option B+. Right. Option B plus is a way whereby you administer ARVs to pregnant and breastfeeding women if you, for life. If you do so, then you can eliminate the transmission of uh, mother to child, mm -hmm. uh, HIV. And we believe that with that, uh, which we introduced only about three months ago, if that happens, with a span of maybe a few years, we shall be saying now from 13,000, right. that number has gone almost to zero. Secondly, of course, we have to deal with that uh, very productive group of, uh, you know, of our population. 
So there's also education through the schools and making sure that we have uh, available, you know, counselors, you know, across the country, including in, in the schools. So we shall be working closely. There was a suggestion or not mm -hmm. quite a mis misunderstanding of a suggestion about providing contraceptives to school-going children. Would you uh, advocate for that? Yeah, actually, that's what we said we didn't agree to that. Yes. Because it'd be changing the culture and mindset okay. of our population. All right. What yes. about the, at the prisons? You've mentioned the maternal health and what uh, program you, you're putting in place there for the youth. What about in prison? Yes, uh, prison is also obviously a difficult one which we have to work with the Minister of Interior. Mm. Because you see, uh, there are many things which happen in prisons. And we need to make sure that um, there's a lot of resources in <laughs> managing those people. <laughs> because it's the most difficult environment, as you may know. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Our time is about up because I understand you have a meeting, so I must let you go at 7.40. I was mm. given those very <laughs> st strict instructions. Mm. Uh, but one and a half years mm. on, I mean, mm. we've just tackled a few of the issues. But it's a huge, very important sector to Kenya as a nation. Um, but the challenges are also numerous. So what is the plan? What is the priority for you going forward for the next three and a half uh, in this particular term for the Jubilee? Uh, that's well, I think we mentioned some of them. And we talk about making sure the free maternity service is uh, successful, yeah. make sure the equipment in our hospitals. Uh, number three, which we did not mention, is to make sure that we got a very successful immunization program. Okay. Uh, you know, last year, July, polio came back to this country after being away since 1984. Mm -hmm. Now, polio, you know, the effect can be devastating, both in terms of the economy and also in terms of the health of our country. So we had about seven campaigns until some people said it's too much. But we had to make sure that we have a very aggressive campaign to eliminate polio. Right. Uh, secondly, we are also introducing what we call the rotavirus, because children, if you look at children, for example, their biggest problem is actually two problems. One, they have a lot of pneumonia, which kills them, and diarrhea. So we introduced what we call pneumococcal vaccine. This is for the pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And also we introduced now what we call the rotavirus, which is basically to treat uh, you know, diarrhea. So there will be a big push in terms of uh, vaccinations, immunization, which is in the national government. That way still we can keep our children you know, free and also work together with the Minister of Education for the deworming program. Kenya has the most successful deworming program which we recognized actually some four months ago in Paris. Right. Uh, so the idea is to make sure you have a healthy nation, you know, children especially, our mothers. And, and with that, I think the investment made in the health sector will certainly be worth it. Will be worth it. On a scale of 1 to 10, where do you rank your performance so far? Well, with the challenges, I said once again, 8 to 10. 8 to 10, that's yes. high. That's an A. Yes, you have to be ambitious. <laughs> you have to be ambitious. ambitious yes. Well, thank you so much, yeah. sir. We appreciate thank you well, coming through. My pleasure. Uh, and talking to us this morning. Mm. And we wish you the very best thank uh, you. in your undertakings in the Ministry of Health. The Health Cabinet Secretary James Masharia with us, our person of interest this morning. Had to let him go early. Uh, he has other matters to attend to.